Grüße. Mesdames et Messieurs, je vous souhaite la bienvenue et vous remercie beaucoup d'être venus si nombreux aujourd'hui pour cet événement très particulier pour notre laboratoire, pour notre faculté et pour notre université. Mais avant toute chose, j'aimerais commencer par remercier certaines personnalités que l'on n'a pas forcément l'habitude de voir dans nos murs universitaires et qui nous font l'honneur d'être présents aujourd'hui. Je voudrais saluer M. Jean-Pierre Prudhon, qui est le consul de Hongrie, M. Orenstein, qui est le commandant de la base de défense de Nancy, le colonel, M. Arnaud Marchal, directeur du Centre de recherche et de développement de Saint-Gobain, en Tamousson. Voilà, et comme je le disais, c'est une journée extraordinaire pour notre laboratoire. Je sais que c'est notre collègue Laetitia Gonzalez qui reçoit le diplôme tant convoité. Mais un peu de sa gloire rejaillit sur nous quand même. À ce titre, je voudrais remercier l'Université de la Reine, et bien sûr son président Pierre Mutsenart et tous ses vice-présidents qui sont assis au premier rang, pour avoir fait ce choix éclairé. Je ne saurais bien sûr oublier notre faculté, faculté des sciences et technologies, avec son doyen Stéphane Flamand et les vice-doyens qui sont assis à ses côtés. Les remercier pour avoir décidé de promouvoir notre candidature au niveau de l'université. Alors c'est réellement un honneur pour notre unité de voir une partie, petite partie de notre travail reconnue par notre établissement, l'année même de la création de notre laboratoire. On va vous montrer voilà, le laboratoire physique et chimie théorique, nouvellement créé au 1er janvier 2018, qui résulte de la fusion de quatre équipes éminente de recherche qu'on avait distribué dans quatre unités avec différentes visées. Et cette fusion nous permet de former une structure cohérente et tout à fait logique de recherche centrée sur la théorie, la modélisation et le développement de méthodes pour décrire la matière. Nous sommes avant tout des physiciens et des chimistes, décrire la matière. Mais la matière en interaction avec son environnement. Quand je parle d'environnement, par exemple, la lumière fait partie de l'environnement. Tout ne se fait pas dans le noir et la lumière interagit avec la matière. C'est justement une des raisons du prix de Laetitia aujourd'hui pour ses éminents travaux à ce sujet. Alors, nous sommes un laboratoire qui est à la frontière entre la physique du solide, les mathématiques, la biologie, la physico-chimie, la chimie de synthèse, les spectroscopies, et encore une fois, avec ces spectroscopies, on se rapproche des travaux de Laetitia. Nous sommes donc particulièrement bien placés pour mener à bien des, des recherches interdisciplinaires que l'on fait, et euh, les applications de nos recherches touchent aussi bien à des nouveaux procédés physico-chimiques d'extraction, par exemple, ou bien alors à trouver des nouveaux matériaux avec des propriétés très particulières, trouver des, des cures anticancéreuses avec ou sans l'aide de la lumière, encore une fois, ou même, pour un dernier exemple, récupérer l'énergie solaire pour en faire soit de l'hydrogène, soit de l'électricité. Donc vous voyez que nous avons quand même quelques activités qui sont directement connectées aux travaux de Laetitia. Je vais éviter de monopoliser la parole plus longtemps, mais avant de terminer, je voudrais remercier et féliciter très sincèrement un jeune collègue, enfin, jeune, oui, forcément, puisqu'il est plus jeune que moi, il est donc forcément jeune, le jeune collègue Antonio, qui est assis là-bas. C'est grâce à lui si la collaboration que l'on a avec Laetitia est aussi fructueuse et pérenne, Merci beaucoup, Antonio, pour tout le travail que tu as accompli, que tu continues à accomplir avec dynamisme et détermination. Et c'est sans doute grâce à la passion qui t'habite que tu arrives à faire tout ceci. Voilà, j'en ai terminé. Je voudrais remercier nos collègues venus de la péninsule ibérique d'avoir fait le voyage. 
Merci beaucoup, Manuel et Otilien. Merci à tous. Et je vais passer la parole maintenant à monsieur le doyen. Stéphane. Mesdames et messieurs, en vos grades et qualités, je ne reprendrai pas l'accueil la, individualisé tel que l'a fait mon collègue. Euh, chers étudiants, parce que je vois qu'il y a un certain nombre d'étudiants dans l'amphithéâtre, euh, je suis très heureux de vous accueillir cet après-midi à la Faculté des sciences et technologies euh, pour ce moment solennel, important pour notre établissement, euh, l'Université de Lorraine. Il s'agit d'une première cette année, euh, enfin une première bis en tout cas, euh, puisque cette cérémonie euh, de remise du titre de docteur honoris causa était auparavant centralisée et elle se fait euh, pour la première fois cette année sous un nouveau format en composante euh, au plus près de la communauté concernée qui est aujourd'hui celle des scientifiques. Nous sommes réunis aujourd'hui pour mettre plus particulièrement à l'honneur la chimie. Alors, ce n'est pas une première à la Faculté des sciences et technologies. En effet, notre plus grande célébrité est un professeur de chimie, Victor Grignard, qui s'est vu remettre avec Paul Sabatier le prix Nobel de chimie en 1912 pour ses travaux sur les organomagnésiens mixtes. Et il a donné son nom aux réactifs de Grignard qui sont utilisés en synthèse organique, par exemple pour l'industrie pharmaceutique. Alors, le bâtiment dans lequel nous nous trouvons porte d'ailleurs le nom de Victor Grignard. Aujourd'hui, c'est une chimie moins organique et beaucoup plus théorique qui est concernée avec les travaux de Laetitia Gonzalez concernant le domaine de la photophysique et de la photochimie computationnelle. Vous aurez un aperçu de son domaine d'expertise et de ses applications dans quelques instants. Donc Laetitia Gonzalez est d'origine espagnole, mais elle nous vient de l'université de Vienne, où elle est euh, professeure titulaire de la chaire de chimie théorique. Alors cela tombe très bien que ce titre lui soit remis en cette année universitaire 2018-2019, car euh, cette année, le ministère de l'Éducation nationale et le ministère de l'Enseignement supérieur et de la Recherche ont baptisé l'année 2018-2019 année de la chimie de l'école à l'université. Le hasard fait donc bien les choses. Il l'est fait d'autant plus que l'année 2019 a été choisie par l'UNESCO pour mettre aussi à l'honneur la chimie, et plus particulièrement Dmitri Mendeleev, euh, qui est le chimiste russe qui, il y a 150 ans, a mis au point la classification euh, périodique des éléments. Chaque année, plusieurs laboratoires font des propositions à la Faculté des sciences et technologies de candidature au titre de docteur honoris causa de l'Université de Lorraine. Le conseil de la faculté classe ces candidatures et transmet sa proposition à l'université qui procède à un examen complémentaire. En 2018, Laetitia Gonzalez était en concurrence avec un biochimiste américain spécialiste des canaux ioniques et un automaticien australien. Son dossier est un dossier d'excellence. Je suis sûr que vous en serez convaincu à l'issue des présentations qui vont suivre. Je suis très heureux que l'université ait suivi la proposition de notre UFR. En tant que doyen de la faculté et aussi à titre personnel, je suis également très fier que ce titre de docteur honoris causa soit remis à une collègue féminine. Ce n'est pas souvent le cas. Pour faire de la chimie théorique, même si je ne suis pas un spécialiste de la discipline étant biologiste, je pense que quand on utilise des graphes, on s'appuie tout autant sur l'axe des X que l'axe des Y. Or, dans notre société du XXIe siècle, dans divers domaines, nous les hommes avec notre chromosome Y, nous avons encore une marge d'avance sur les femmes avec leurs deux chromosomes X. J'espère que le, teur, le, le titre de docteur honoris causa décerné aujourd'hui à Laetitia Gonzalez sera un élément parmi d'autres qui contribuera à faire que dans les années à venir, 
les femmes ne travailleront plus gratuitement à partir du 6 novembre à 15h35, vu ce que l'on a entendu récemment. Alors sur ces paroles teintées d'espoir, je vous souhaite à toutes et tous de passer un agréable moment au sein de notre faculté des sciences et technologies. Merci beaucoup Stéphane. Maintenant, Pierre Mutzenart, notre président, va te succéder. Mais t'as as grandi. Mesdames, Messieurs, Monsieur le Directeur, Dear Professor Gonzalez, euh, c'est vraiment un, un plaisir un peu particulier que d'être là ce soir avec vous. Plaisir particulier parce que cette discipline de la chimie théorique, eh bien, c'est la première discipline finalement vers laquelle j'ai été en recherche. Il y a quelqu'un qui s'en souvient et qui est ici puisqu'il m'a accueilli dans un stage à l'époque en licence, dans un laboratoire qui était déjà un laboratoire de chimie théorique avant de passer par d'autres étapes. Et euh, c'est vraiment un, un plaisir que d'être là euh, parmi vous. Bon, après, j'ai mal bifurqué au moins deux fois. Un, parce que je ne suis pas resté en chimie théorique. Deux, parce que je suis devenu président de l'université. Mais ça, c'est une autre histoire. C'est vraiment un plaisir que d'être là et... Euh, d'honorer une scientifique de grand renom international. Euh, je vais en dire quelques mots, quelques mots aussi. Et, et je pense que c'est aussi, comme l'a dit Xavier Osfeld, un très beau moment pour ce laboratoire qui s'est créé au 1er janvier 2018. Et euh, je pense, Madame Gonzalez, que vous allez en être la marraine euh, de manière euh, définitive avec euh, cet euh, honneur que vous nous faites et que nous vous faisons en vous décernant le doctorat honoris causa de l'Université de Lorraine. Vos mérites, ils vont être relatés scientifiquement par quelqu'un qui le fera bien mieux que moi, qui est notre collègue Antonio Monari. Mais comme il s'agit de lumière, je vais essayer de mettre en lumière quelques aspects. Le premier et qui a déjà été évoqué, c'est que c'est aussi une fierté pour l'université parce que le conseil scientifique de l'université ou la communauté nous propose hélas trop rarement des femmes scientifiques pour devenir docteur honoris causa de l'université. Et vous allez être la première dans la jeune université de l'université de Lorraine à être la première femme docteur honoris causa de cette université. Vous allez être vite rattrapée puisqu'il y en aura une deuxième dans... Dans quelques, dans quelques semaines, et, et c'est plutôt un plaisir parce que nous avons, et euh, je crois qu'on peut regarder les communautés en face les unes des autres, un, un travail à faire pour que euh, cet équilibre ou cette parité, alors j'aime pas parité parce que ça voudrait dire qu'on met un pour un, mais qu'une représentation équilibrée des genres en termes de, de responsables, de scientifiques, puisse s'établir. On sait qu'il y a un certain nombre de freins, euh, quelquefois à, euh, à ce que des, euh, des jeunes femmes se projettent pour prendre euh, des postes, parce que les carrières sont aussi difficiles, parce que la mobilité, d'ailleurs, dont vous avez fait part, n'est pas toujours euh, facile dans un parcours euh, euh, de jeunes femmes. Elle n'est pas forcément toujours plus facile pour, euh, pour les jeunes hommes, mais, mais néanmoins, je crois que c'est un aspect qu'il faut, euh, euh, qu faut souligner. Ceci étant, c'est surtout les qualités scientifiques qu'il faudrait mettre en lumière et qu'on va mettre en lumière pour vous. Euh, sur cette discipline que j'aime beaucoup, la chimie théorique et la, la physico-chimie, vous êtes chimiste théoricienne spécialiste du traitement théorique de la photophysique et de la photochimie computationnelle. Des beaux mots. Derrière, il y a quelques chiffres quand même qui sont impressionnants, sans révéler votre âge, parce que ça ne se fait pas. 250 publications et de nombreuses citations qui témoignent de l'intérêt de vos travaux pour les communautés auxquelles vous appartenez et surtout qui ont retenu l'attention du Conseil scientifique de l'Université de Lorraine quand le laboratoire et la faculté ont proposé votre candidature. Votre travail est un travail très visible dans la communauté et il a déjà été récompensé d'autres manières par une médaille de la World Association of Theoretical and Computational Chemistry et d'une autre récompense, les Lodwin Lectures, en 2014. 
ce qui montre à quel point votre parcours est brillant et que les travaux que vous faites, au-delà du nombre, parce que le nombre des publications pourrait rentrer dans le débat, mais ont surtout un, un impact et euh, amènent de nouveaux concepts et de nouvelles idées dans la communauté scientifique et créent de la connaissance. Transformer la matière grâce à la lumière, oui, c'est une spécialité des, des universités. Et euh, je crois qu'on on doit saluer le travail qui a été réalisé en, en Lorraine par vous pour créer et donner corps à ce nouveau laboratoire de physique et chimie théorique. Alors, si on regarde un peu plus loin, comme je connais un peu l'histoire, c'est un peu faire et défaire, mais... Euh, on refait d'une autre manière, parce qu'il y a une composante de physique qui est un peu nouvelle à l'intérieur du laboratoire. Et je crois que c'est une communauté qui a une force et un impact sur la recherche. Outre vous, il y a aussi un professeur at Lorraine qui a été nommé à l'intérieur du laboratoire. Et cette chimie théorique est très présente depuis très longtemps. Peut-être que les plus jeunes d'entre vous ne le savent pas, mais... Un des premiers, euh, une des premières chaires de chimie, chimie physique en France a été une chaire de chimie physique à l'université de Nancy à l'époque, qui a été occupée par Bariol, me semble-t-il. Et euh, Bariol a été un de ces grands scientifiques euh, et euh, de ces grands chimistes de, du début du siècle dernier, et qui, avec euh, notamment De Breuil, avec qui euh, il était, je crois, euh, ami en relation, on produit une connaissance importante et vous en êtes toutes et tous les héritiers ici. Je voudrais enfin revenir sur votre parcours à vous, parce que c'est quand même un parcours éclair à la vitesse de la lumière, peut-être que c'est celle-là qui vous intéresse dans vos travaux, et surtout dans ce parcours éclair, ce qui nous intéresse et ce qui intéresse l'Université de Lorraine, c'est que la relation que vous avez de travail avec ce laboratoire, avec Antonio Molinari et certainement d'autres collègues, soit une relation qui dure, qui fasse progresser la connaissance et qui continue à rendre ce domaine plus visible à Nancy, aussi en Autriche. Et je crois que c'est quelque chose qui est extrêmement important pour la communauté scientifique Lorraine, c'est que les docteurs honoris causa que nous honorons actuellement soient des gens avec qui l'université soit liée. Alors quand on dit l'université, c'est bien sûr des collègues, des équipes qui se lient et qui créent comme ça un maillage plus fort. Et le titre de docteur honoris causa, ici, vient saluer aussi cette relation très particulière que vous avez avec les équipes de l'université de Lorraine. Enfin, peut-être, ce que je voudrais souligner, surtout à ce moment un peu historique, où on parle beaucoup d'Europe, c'est que vous avez et vous êtes un, un, un produit, excusez-moi du terme, européen. Vous avez euh, euh, exercé dans différentes villes, vous avez des diplômes de différents pays. Euh, je crois que c'est un parcours tout à fait euh, exceptionnel et j'espère que ça donnera peut-être euh, l'envie aux plus jeunes qui sont ici, aux doctorants, mais certains, certaines viennent, viennent déjà d'ailleurs de, de poursuivre cette mobilité, de poursuivre non pas pour la mobilité, mais parce qu'à chaque fois, elle est synonyme de nouveaux échanges, d'échanges interculturels, mais aussi d'échanges avec des collègues qui n'ont pas eu la même formation. Et cette rencontre est toujours une rencontre fructueuse en termes de nouvelles idées pour faire progresser la science. En conclusion, je voudrais rappeler que le titre de docteur honoris causa que nous allons vous remettre a été bien sûr désidé par les plus hautes autorités de l'université, proposé par le conseil scientifique lors de débats qui sont quelquefois un peu longs parce que, comme l'a rappelé le professeur Flamand, euh, ben, il y a des très beaux dossiers qui sont présentés, euh, validé par le conseil d'administration, mais aussi validé par le ministère parce qu'il s'agit aussi de relations internationales pour la France. Comme son nom l'indique, il est honorifique et confie plutôt des devoirs que des droits. Je compte sur vous aujourd'hui, encore plus que ce que vous avez fait dans les années passées, pour être une ambassadrice de la Lorraine scientifique et académique de par le monde, en Autriche et ailleurs, je ne sais pas, en Espagne, en Allemagne, vu votre parcours. C'est un point qui sera très précieux pour porter des réseaux européens de recherche 
et de mobilité en, entre nos institutions. Euh, je sais pouvoir déjà compter sur vous pour nourrir séminaires et enseignements à destination de nos étudiants de master, de nos élèves ingénieurs, de nos doctorants. Enfin, je voudrais dire qu'il faut remercier les personnes qui vous ont proposé pour ce titre, les professeurs Monari, Asfeld des Flamands, euh, et ainsi que l'ensemble de, de la communauté qui vous accueille. Et ce sera vraiment un honneur pour moi, dans un instant, de vous remettre les titres de docteur honoris causa de l'université. Merci. Monsieur Monari, s'il vous plaît. Oui. Merci, merci le directeur, merci le président, euh, chers collègues, chers étudiants, mesdames et messieurs, dire Laetitia. Alors, c'est pour moi un très grand honneur d'être ici pour, euh, et un plaisir pour vous présenter les mérites scientifiques de Laetitia Gonzalez et donc les raisons pour lesquelles euh, sa candidature a été retenue. Néanmoins, Laetitia ne parle pas très bien français et en plus on est tous, ou la plupart d'entre nous, entre scientifiques, donc il y a une langue qui nous est familière, c'est l'anglais, et donc je vais continuer mon discours en anglais. So, what I'm trying to do here is try to answer the following questions. Why has the University of Lorraine uh, decided to honor Leticia Gonzalez and her scientific career? Which are her achievements? What are her relationships with our university? I believe it is both a very simple and a very complicated task that I'm facing. It's very simple because of the outstanding merit that Xavier and uh, Pierre have already uh, presented. But uh, those achievements are so many and so globally important that it will be difficult to summarize them all in a short time. Uh, I would nevertheless try and do my best. So Leticia Gonzalez is a theoretical chemist And as it been said, she started her scientific career with a PhD from uh, Autonomous University of Madrid that was awarded in uh, 1998. The PhD was uh, performed under the supervision of Otilia Mo and Manuel Janetz. And remarkably, both of them are here, sitting there. They have decided to join us in Nancy to share this moment with Leticia and us all. And that's uh, a very good pleasure. And we thank both of you on my behalf and I think on behalf of the laboratory. So in 1999, Leticia moved to uh, Germany for a postdoc at the Freie University of Berlin, working with Jörg Mönz. And from this period, her scientific interest that during the PhD were mostly devoted to the study of intermolecular interaction and H bonds, started to shift toward the study of interaction between light and matters and most notably the effect of laser fields on chemical reactivity. After obtaining her habilitation in 2004, she was appointed a professor position at the University of Vienna in Germany to finally move in 2011 at the University of Vienna, where she's full professor, and she is the responsible for the theoretical chemistry group. Leticia, it has been said by the president, scientific score is simply impressive. Uh, Her work has been published in more than 260 articles in very prestigious journals like Science, Chemical Science, Journal of American Chemical Societies. And besides, her work has been cited more than 7,000 times, and she has an H index of 44. I know that statistics like that are pretty cold, even if impressive in this case, but I think there is something more. And I need to say that what, they, what is behind that is that the international recognition of Leticia is equally impressive. Uh, just two examples that have already been cited. She has been awarded in 2011 the Dirac Medal by the World Association of Theoretical Chemists, the WATOC. This is a medal who is rewarding the best computational chemist in the world and the, under, under the age of 40. And in 2014, she was also uh, nominated to perform the Lodin Lecture at the Uppsala University that is an annual conference held to honor the memory of one of the founding fathers of computational chemistry, Per Olof Lodin, and is always delivered by world leading, leading outstanding theoretical and computational chemists. I believe those facts, which present only a small part of Leticia's achievements, 
certainly may remove all the possible doubts concerning our merits and our career. But still, which are the Leticia's scientific interests? And what are the advancements that her work has brought to the community and to the university? Leticia, as, we, as it has been said, is a theoretical and computational chemist. As such, she uses mathematical models, algorithms, and computers to study and rationalize physics and chemistry. When properly used, computational chemistry becomes a real ultimate computational microscope that allows us to observe, analyze, and rationalize the interaction between atoms and their evolution, as well as the interaction and rearrangements of electrons. This will permit to understand fundamental processes and phenomena, but also to predict the behavior of unknown materials and hence drive the rational development of smart systems. However, as well as the resolution and accuracy of a conventional microscope depends on the quality of its lenses, the performance of the computational microscope will depend on the quality of the model that one uses and on the control of the approximation that are needed to solve the problem. And I think that a large part of the activity of Leticia Gonzalez has been devoted to increase the quality of the model constituting the computational microscope in order to increase its precision and to catch subtle yet fundamental effects that, they, that may ultimately drive the physical phenomena. And more importantly, among all the possible paths, Leticia has chosen to focus on a very difficult and challenging problem that is describing on the molecular and electronic level photochemistry and photophysics. In other words, what she wants to precisely describe is how light interacts with matter and which are the modifications to the reactivity and the physical pro properties that are induced by, the ra by radiations. The interaction of light and matter are not only an academic curiosity. Indeed, they are at the base of many fundamental phenomena that assures life on Earth as we know it. Thanks to photosynthesis or to the mechanism of vision of superior animals that can be ultimately described in an assemble of photochemical reactions. But photochemistry can also help in leading the fight for many great societal challenges that we are all facing. The mm, photochemistry help in the production of clear, renewable energies by a solar cell or water splitting devices. Photochemistry can be used in molecular switches, in light emitting devices, or in optoelectronics that you always touch when you use your smartphone. But light can also be used in combination with properly designed drugs to fight more specifically against cancer and other serious diseases. However, the task to choose, as I said, is difficult because the description of the excited states, the states into which the matter is pushed by light, is much more difficult and computational demanding than the description of the ground state. Hence, particular algorithms should be used and special techniques need to be mastered. And if one wants to know what happens to a chemical system after its interaction with light, we cannot be satisfied with the static description. We cannot do simply a picture taken at a certain time. Instead, we need to follow how the states evolve with time. We need to go from a picture to a movie. However, once again, making a movie in the excited states is much more complicated than record one for the ground state. Because when a system is excited, it will not follow only one single path, only one defined route, but it will instead hop to and from different paths. This kind of hops that in learned way we call non-adiabatic phenomena will, in a certain sense, lead to understanding the photoexcited processes and are in large measure, measure responsible for the peculiar reactivity of photoexcited systems and so they cannot be neglected. And moreover, if we want to know a material or a complex biological environment reacts to light, we cannot study a small system in gas phase. We should take into account how the complex molecular surrounding may alter and modify the evolution and the reactivity, as well as the non-adiabatic phenomena, the jumps, the crosstalk that I've talked about. Well, what Leticia wanted to do was indeed taking into account all of that. And so she decided to invest in the development of an original codes that allows to describe the evolution of excited states of complex chemical systems in complex environments. The code that has been developed by Leticia's group is called SHARK, 
That means surface hopping with arbitrary coupling, but I think there is also a pun intended, right, with the name. Uh, and what is more serious is that this code is now the widely used by the scientific community. I would also like to underline that by decision of the authors is also freely available and can be public distributed and downloaded. And I think this is important because it contributes greatly to the, to the diffusion of open science models and to the sharing of scientific knowledge and information. Shark is also original anyway, because it allows taking into account, as the full name indicate for the ones who, are, who have listened to what I'm saying, that general coupling between the excited state and eventual external perturbation can take into account. So for instance, with Shark, you can model how a complex laser field will modify the properties of a chemical system and how it will modify the reactivity. Furthermore, it also includes what is called by us spin orbit coupling, and else it will allow transition between singlet and triplet states, states of different spin multiplicity. That can seem rather exotic, but it's not. It's instead an aspect, an aspect of utmost importance to model photophysics and photochemistry. Uh, because it allows un understanding phenomena that, is, that are ubiquitous and extremely important, such as model phosphorescence, but also the mechanism and the action of the drugs that can work under the effect of light. Or from a total different point of view, it also allowed to rationalize the production of DNA lesions by the effect of, U of ultraviolet light. And this is one of the causes that is recognized as one of the effects inducing skin cancer appearances. So you see, it's rather far from just academic curiosity. More recently, Shark, whose uh, new and last version has been public released uh, just some weeks ago, something, has been extended to take into account the effects of the, molec of the molecular surroundings. So not only one molecule, but all the, all the other molecules that are around. And this uses a multi-scale approach that based, again from the learned, on the hybrid quantum mechanical molecular and mechanical models. The inclusion of the environmental effect is not, even, not entirely trivial, and it brings important complications which have been and, have, and are being appropriately tackled by Letitia's group, just as a, to cite someone, the necessity to provide an adequate statistical sampling of the complex systems. On the other hand, the presence of the environment allows to improve the overall description of the phenomena, bridging the gap between theory and experience, and pointing the fact that the environment, far from being just a spectator, is indeed tuning or driving the whole process. Hence, the originality of Letitia's method and code, let's say of her own microscope, has allowed to shed light, if you want it's a pun, on very different phenomena, ranging from material science to biology, always providing a clear molecular and electronic resolution. Leticia has obtained impressive results in describing how UV lights does indeed lead to the production of DNA lesions, and which are the mechanisms that are involved. These results, in addition to answer crucial biolog biological questions, may also allow in the longer time scale to develop adequate protective strategy against the effect of UV radiation. She has also shown how some uh, phototherapeutic drugs, drugs that interact with light, may interact with DNA or biological membranes, and how the combined effect of the environment and of the molecular vibrations of the drug may explain their therapeutic efficiency, in particular favoring, once again, the triple state population. Once again, this knowledge offer a so detailed description of the overall processes that one may now envisage to increase the drug efficiency by a computationally driven rational molecular design. She has also studied a number of different systems. Let me cite, because it's something that we also do together, different transition metal compounds used either for energy production or in light emitting device or uh, lying at the top of biological systems like protein. And she was able to clearly underline the peculiar property, especially as compared to simpler organic systems. Remarkably, this impressive scientific challenge has been completed with the realization of the dynamic description of the process involved 
on metal containing compounds in complex environments. Let me say that the task was simply scaring from the point of view of a computational chemist because of the impressive computational complexity, the huge density of electronic states, the complex and high coupling, and the overall impressive cost. However, using the protocols and the codes efficiently de developed in our, in our group, Letitia has been successful in achieving this unprecedented, this unprecedented full dynamic resolution. As it has been said, Letitia is not only an outstanding scientist, our collaboration with our university, and in particular with our laboratory, the LPCT, are many and I hope fruitful. In 2015, she was appointed as invited professor at the University of Lorraine, and she spent one month in our laboratory. At the same time, other members of our laboratory, of our group, have spent time in Vienna, and we are also engaged in some common uh, funded grants. The work we have performed together have been already recognized by the community, and that's, it's important. And our efforts are centered on the modeling of the behavior of molecules exposed to light in complex biological environments, such as nucleic acid, proteins, and we certainly help in provide, I hope, a breaking through comprehension of crucial biological phenomena that could later on be used for developing novel and more efficient drugs. I think I have convinced you that Leticia is an outstanding scientist for all, everything that she realized. She's a successful young woman who is managing and directing a prestigious research group in one of the world leading universities. She's one of the most important theoretical chemists at the world level. And I can say that she is also, and especially, a good friend. I would like, however, to conclude with a personal less thought and a personal less consideration. Leticia is Spanish, she spent years in Germany, and she now works in Austria. As my accent tells you, I'm not really French. I'm Italian, but I'm now working in France. And so I think there is something else that this ceremony could tell us. Science means an open society. Science means open borders. Science means freedom. Science is global. Science is against every nationalities. And if I look at this stage, I can see different flags. There, there will be different anthems played, and I'm proud of all of them. But there is, however, one flag that represents all of us and all our histories, the European flag. The European flag and the values and hopes that it embodies. So I'm really deeply honored to have been allowed the possibility to talk about Letitia and about Letitia's achievements today. And I'm deeply honored and proud she's receiving the Doctorate of Honoris Causa of the university I belong to. It is indeed an honor for us, for our laboratory, for our university, to count you, Letitia, among the members of our community now. An honor we should be, and we are, extremely proud of. And so Letitia, thank me. Let me thank you for accepting this doctorate. And let me look forward to the excited collaboration we will certainly continue developing together, and to your work that, if I may conclude in a funny way, will certainly help bring light to darkness. Thank you. Voilà. Mais je te laisse prendre les choses, je vais, je vais faire du bruit en attendant. Donc Pierre Mutzenart prend le diplôme et l'épitoge. On pose le diplôme sur le pupitre. Que tu donnes en premier, tu donnes le si diplôme et puis après tu mettras un épitoge. Oui. On fait comme ça On fait comme ça Dear Professor Gonzalez, it's really an honor and a pleasure to... Uh, give you this title of Dr. Ridley's Cosa of the University of Lorraine. And um, it's really an honor uh, for me personally to, to give this to a, a professor of theoretical chemistry. Thank you. L'épitose, uh, c'est la petite partie devant. Ça, ça va dernier.
that finished? Because we, we have some questions. So I will start with you. Uh, so you will see, this is a, a little piece of art because there is a lot of uh, uh, glass art in, in North here and the surrounding area. So it will be. Uh, Thank you very much. And then you will be difficult. And this is. Un très joli cadeau dôme. And, and this is something, something else you, you cannot see, but it's also a piece of, uh, of glasses. You should speak to the microphone. I, I should speak in the microphone. Okay, this is also, but this is a special and uh, only for Dr. Rino Escorza and very important people from the university. This was made uh, uh, near Nancy uh, with an artist, and it's the logo of the University of Lorraine, which has been made by Fab Lab uh, Fabrication, and uh, we, with a lot of uh, people of the university involved. So it's totally unique. And then you, you have to yes, put this. And two more things. This is a book about Nancy because I don't know if uh, all, all the people know, but uh, in, um, in the building of the University of Lorraine, we have this beautiful building with beautiful stained glasses. Uh, some people know and uh, you can visit uh, this place and uh, it, it's really nice so you can have some look about that and, and this is something special because you know in, in French we make this Mathes dans 180 secondes which means that uh, PhD students have uh, three minutes to speak on public about uh, the subject or their thesis uh, and then we, we, we ask some people to make yeah, some, uh, comics. some comics, comics uh, two, uh, two page for each uh, PhD student, and this is the three last year of this PhD student, and this is also a story of science about all these, uh, these students. So perhaps I will give, you, give this to you, to <laughs> daughter. <laughs> so they can look at the comics. You want to look at the comics? You can, you can look inside where the, the mark is, then the bookmark, because it's the PhD thesis of uh, Hugo Gattuso, the PhD yeah. student of Antonio. Who, who, who was at the, at the final at the University of Florence. So I will give, you, give this to you. <laughs> so you can see the well, comics. <laughs> it's no more yet. So I'm sure no, you will pay extra charge for your pay, flight back. <laughs> yeah. uh, falling down. Uh, 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 and then uh, please come here for, for the photography. And, uh, close. Nous lançons. <laughs> Mesdames et messieurs, je vais vous demander de bien vouloir vous lever. Et nous allons euh, écouter tous ensemble euh, l'hymne national espagnol. Merci beaucoup.
edition, the stage is yours. Madame and Monsieur, ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, overwhelmed and really very touched. So this is a very difficult moment, but I really have to say thanks to many people. So first of all, I'd like to thank the president, Magnificent and Professor Mutzenhardt for this amazing moments here, this, uh, this distinction, and uh, this is also all the fault of uh, Antonio Monari and Xavier Asfeld. So my very deep thanks to them for promoting this, because this is uh, it's amazing to be at this site. You cannot imagine. Of course, there have been many people who have been instrumental in uh, shaping my career life and probably shaping who I am. And I'd like to mention uh, some of them. So first of all, I'd like to thank my PhD supervisors, Otilia Mo and Manuel Yanez, who I am so lucky and happy that they are here with me today because they taught me many things scientifically, but also many things personally and morally. They also infected me with the passion for science. And I think this is something which has kept me going all these years. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Mike Robb from um, London, who I spent also some time, and it was my first contact with light, and uh, this marked um, me for, I didn't know at that time, but this really marked me for all my life. And uh, finally, also my habilitation mentor, Professor Jormans from Berlin, because I spent there many years, and I learned many things about dynamics, and I also learned the German way of doing science. And this, uh, this, this precision and efficiency, I think, is uh, very important in science and brought me very far. Uh, besides that, as my uh, peace supervisor says very often, to do good science is easy. You really have good people. And I was very lucky and very honored to have uh, an excellent um, cohorts, excellent generations of PhD students and postdocs that they were always ready for my crazy ideas and uh, they were also as motivated as me just to convert these ideas into, into useful science and also sometimes to have brilliant ideas and um, by having an atmosphere of uh, freedom and communication and discussion I think that we could really have very nice brainstormings in which many nice science came out but I'm really indebted to all of them because it's not me who does the science, it's them who do the science. And from these people, I really would like to just mention a few of them in chronological order because I think their contributions, they have been essential for uh, yeah, shaping or tailoring what uh, my life is. And these are Ines Corral, Jesus Gonzalez, Philip Marketan, Sebastian May, um, Juan Jose Nogueira, and Felix Plaza. I think they have really left an in an, an, a very rich heritage to the group that was continue, and uh, there were seeds from which also other science was um, growing. So last but not least, I would like to thank Markus Oppel. Many co-workers of the group would always thank Markus Oppel for keeping the machines running. He is the system administrator. That's, of course, enormously important, because if the machines are not running, the science doesn't run. But I would also like to add that he also keeps my life running. And uh, this is uh, very important, and without his generosity, I think, and his support, I would have never managed to be what I am now. So I want to say thank you. I want to say uh, gracias. I want to say merci. And I want to say danke to him and to my daughters, who also <coughs> distract me from science, and this is also very, <laughs> very healthy from time to time, to, so to all of them, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Leticia. Ladies and gentlemen, I will ask you to stand up. <laughs> and this time we're going to listen to the European Ethem.
Thank you very much, and uh, time. time for science, exactly. Leticia, the stage is yours. So it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure now to go to science. And uh, I think Antonio made a fantastic job uh, introducing my field. Actually, I think there is nothing else to tell. He told everything. I'm only going to put pictures to his words. And he was also extremely kind. Uh, this was the most amazing, the best introduction as a chairman that I ever had. So allow me in the next 30 minutes to tell you a little bit um, about science and also I just try to make a couple of personal notes in this presentation. So my presentation is titled Lighting and Light and Darkness in Theoretical Chemistry. There is a sort of a pun here because the, there are these terms are, of course you have heard, I, I deal with light and um, we also have darkness of course in this from the chemical point of view but I also want to make the metaphor sometimes that we have light, we see things, we have enlightenment but sometimes we are totally blind to many things. And I hope that I also convey you that despite all these successes that uh, me and many people have achieved in this field, there's still a lot of darkness on that. So light is everywhere. Uh, and given its omnipresence, omnipr omnipresence, maybe one does not realize how important that is. So without light, we would not uh, live in, in the earth um, as, as we do now, so light is just the, the basic motor behind photosynthesis, which uh, so say just gives the light that, that, we know, that we know. Light initiates many chemical reactions. For example, this is uh, the first step behind vision. Light controls the circadian rhythms that they just make our cycle of 24 hours. And light is involved in the ozone generation. I don't need to tell you how important that is or is also involved in processes which maybe they are not so well known uh, from the name bioluminescence, but um, they, are, they produce many beautiful pictures in nature, seeing um, animals that they have light and many other processes. So I think it's not difficult to convince you that the impact of light is, uh, is very broad. So I have discussed some of these processes in biology. Um, here you have a few pictures. So light is involved in the in, in some of the DNA lesions and photo damage can also nowadays be used in something which is very exciting for neurobiology, so the optogenetics, uh, you can control the brain just putting some light signals and this is a very relatively recent um, um, field of research. And uh, chemistry is full of light. I mean, you, you don't realize, I mean, so this is uh, synthesis, of course, this is something maybe very university um, oriented, but we have dyes everywhere. So there's a lot of uh, money going on in developing different dyes and um, um, how to avoid that, uh, for example, beer does not degrade to the, to the light. So this is also very important for, for, for economics. And uh, what now is also extremely uh, a hot topic is to develop materials which um, are in the field of renewable energy, so for solar, solar cells, also electronics, photocatalysis, uh, solar conversion. So light is in many different places. And uh, if we want to contribute as a science, as a, I mean, if science wants to contribute, or we as scientists want to contribute to these many different fields, we have to ask many relevant questions. So for example, what happens to the molecules after you have the light excitation? Or how is light energy used to create new molecules? Or how light does induce some functionality, yeah? for example, in the molecular machines? We have seen in nature there are many processes that are driven by light. Can we copy this machinery from light and can we mimic and be transferred this to technology? Or something with maybe is a little bit more fancy. I mean, one can really manipulate chemistry with light in a very active, active way. So these questions maybe uh, summarize most of the important things that uh, one can ask for trying to make an impact in, uh, in, in chemistry. And these are questions that are very well suited for um, theoretical chemistry, in particular for the field of computational photochemistry, which is the field of research that I've been devoted the last 30 years. So here I show you a uh, few pictures which just summarize uh, some of the topics that um, we enjoy in the field of light. We do also my lab, that's all the things, but light is our, oops, 
Light is our, our hobby and uh, we like most and then um, we have made a lot of uh, different contributions in the field of um, understanding how light interacts with uh, DNA building blocks and how you can get uh, damage, um, how to understand fundamental processes in, in different dyes, um, how light can impact um, transition metal complexes which they can have roles in photocatalysis for a solar energy conversion but also for releasing pieces which can be used as, as, uh, as drugs in, in medicine. Something more fancy, I mean, if you have light, you can also make some switches or some molecular machines. Um, yeah, they can use as uh, drug therapy or the interaction of some of these uh, molecules within the membranes. Uh, they can activate ion channels, which is important for the optogenetics. I'm not going to have the time to talk about all these fields. I will only give you a little flavor of some of these topics. But if we want to follow um, how to model with, uh, with theory these type of processes, let me just start very basic. So I apologize for those who know this, but uh, maybe for others this is important um, to, to just speak from the beginning. So we just need to understand how the molecule is excited and what happens. So normally these type of processes, they're summarized in a diagram like this. So you have a molecule which is in the electronic ground state, it's excited, it goes to a um, particular state, this is what we call a bright state, in opposition to dark states. I mean, dark states are, for example, in this picture, this one, because you, d you don't see, light doesn't see, so it's a dark state. But these dark states, they are very important because you can have transitions. So for example, here, there is a non-radiative transition from this S2, the second singlet to the first singlet. Internal conversion, you have a transition from a bright state to a dark state. And uh, these dark states, which are not seen in first place by the light, they can have a very important role. So for example, here, you are now in this state. And then from here you can have processes which are mediated by light, like fluorescence, which is important in many, in many economic processes. Or you can have also other type of non-adiabatic, non-radiative processes, like intersystem crossing, going to triplets, from which again you can have phosphorescence. So these are the type of processes that we're going to be dealing with. Yeah? In, in general, the most difficult ones are the non-radiative ones, so inter internal conversion and intersystem crossing. And uh, this is Nevertheless, a very simplified picture about these levels. So molecules, they have the so-called potential energy surfaces. So this, sorry, oops. So this is the same picture as here, but now in, in reality you have potential energy surfaces. You have to imagine like when you are in the mountains and uh, you are in the ground state, you are in a valley, then you are excited and now you can just slide down to different places. So whenever you have non-radiative processes like internal conversion or inter-system crossing, you need to have crossings. So these processes cannot occur if you don't have an actual, a real uh, crossing between the two potentials. And this is normally called a conical intersection because of the form of this, uh, of the topology of this, of this feature. And only through these funnels, you can just go quickly to other states and deactivate. So this means that if we want with theory to understand uh, what a molecule is doing after irradiation, you have to get knowledge of these potential energy surfaces and then how the molecule is also going to evolve in these potential energy surfaces. So in order to get this, you have actually to marry two disciplines in theoretical chemistry. One is quantum chemistry. So the one workhorse is the quantum chemistry. The quantum chemistry will just provide you a stationary and a static vision of, uh, of, of, of chemistry of the molecule. It's giving you the topologies of these potential energy surfaces. Okay? That's already very helpful, but you need to know how the molecule really evolves in these surfaces. And that's where dynamics comes into play. So this is like taking a picture, but you really need the movie as Antonio was saying. So you need to, to make a movie. I mean, you have the light and the molecule. This is now in a very simple picture, so the diatomic molecule. You need to see how this molecule is going to evolve in time, and you have all the different snapshots. So you need to have the quantum chemistry and the chemical dynamics together in order to understand what the molecule is doing after light irradiation. So, an theoretical chemist, so I'm going to show you only two equations. These are the two key equations that we have to solve. So, for the quantum chemistry, one has to solve the time independent is running an equation, okay, so it's an electronic equation that delivers us energies, that delivers us the topologies of these potential energy surfaces, and uh, with some tricks also you can get the different 
crossing points and how strong these surfaces are, cup are coupled. Yeah, so what is called the couplings. Now, the dynamics. The dynamics is uh, is obtained when you solve the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So this is the equation here. Now you see this is the so-called wave function. Here only depends on coordinates, but here depends on coordinates and depends on time. And if you solve this equation, then you really get the actual pathway. You get the time scales because you are solving the things in time. And then if you have enough statistics, you also would get the quantum yields. Because you see, when you have all these crossings, you have many different channels in which you can lose population, right? So as I say, reactions, they are always very, typically very inefficient. They just lose population in many different um, in many different ways. So you would say, okay, so what? You have two equations you have to solve. Now the trick is, or the evidence of this is that these equations can only be solved analytically for very, very small systems. Yeah. So typically for two particle system. And two particle system is not very useful in chemistry. So if you want to go into chemistry, you have many particles, then you need to have approximate solutions of this of these equations. And there are many flavors and there are many successes, but there are also many pitfalls that will just um, come come later to that. So to solve these two equations, this is the challenge that a computational chemist has to has to go go, and that's where that's why we cannot solve everything. But let me just to tell you how it all started. How did I pick up this type of problems? How did I start it? So as has been mentioned, I mean I studied chemistry in, in Madrid at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. And um, after I finished my studies, I moved for a master thesis to, to, to London. Actually, at that time, uh, the professor I moved to it was uh, in the King's College, London. And that was my first contact with light. So in that laboratory, I was working under the supervision of Professor Mike Rock. For six months, I started to be in contact with the quantum chemistry for SI states. So I studied in 1994, but actually I continued in 95, 96, 97. That was a very, very complicated problem. I had to work in the cyclo addition of this simple molecule, acrolein, with, uh, with ethylene. So this is uh, a process which is called photocyclo addition. So at the very end, you get this cycle. But you can have different attacks. You can have many different minima in all these side state surfaces. You have many transition states. This was a nightmare really a nightmare. So at least in 2000, yeah, so it took really six years, but eventually we just got uh, a publication. That was my first contact with, uh, with light and, uh, and molecules in the side states. Then uh, from there I returned to Spain to do my PhD and there I was um, dealing with the quantum chemistry in the ground state. So from 95 to 98, I was working with uh, Manuel Janez and uh, Onotilia Mo. They were my uh, PhD supervisors. And uh, the problems that we had, they were uh, related with ground state reactivity, and in particular with um, calculating and investigating properties of halogen bonded systems and the associated potentials. So we had intermolecular, inter intramolecular halogen bonds, and we were looking at properties. Also, at the very end of the thesis, we also, I'm sorry, you cannot see very well, but this is. Um, yeah, a very old picture. We were looking at some side states of this uh, proton transfer uh, molecule and uh, seeing that we have uh, yeah, very many differences when you use uh, different methods. So I was almost coming back to, to, to do some sun side states. And then when I finished my PhD, I just moved to Germany to the Free University Berlin to do my habilitation with uh, Professor John Manns, as I, I mentioned before. And there I had the chance to put light even to work, because it was not only about understanding how light makes something to molecules, but also how light can be even tuned and shape it to produce a particular reaction. So this is uh, summarized in, in, in this picture here, which was uh, something we published in Science, and we were also very happy that this worked this way. You have a molecule, in this case, um, organometallic complex, and then depending how this laser light is applied, you can just uh, produce one type of reaction or another one. So in this case, was you can dis dissociate or you don't dissociate. So, and these this, uh, light pulses, they were like acting in the same time regime as the molecules are moving, so in a femtosecond time scale. So this was the time I was dealing with ultra-fast photo-induced dynamics and uh, the field which is called coherent control of chemical reactions using coherent light, which means with lasers, to manipulate chemistry. So after that, um, 
I was in Germany for a long time, even longer than my habilitation. You have heard, I just moved to Jena, and then from Jena, I moved to Vienna, where I am now. But you can see that my scientific background is a potpourri of three main uh, building blocks. So I had knowledge on granular state reactivity from my time in, uh, and in Madrid. I have knowledge from the quantum chemistry for excited states that was initiated uh, in London, and I had a lot of knowledge from the laser-induced dynamics that was of my time on Berlin. So what it became of me afterwards is just the linear combination of, this, of these three things. So we, liked, we like it. It's challenging, as Antonio was saying, to treat a side states, and I realized very soon that you need to put these two things together, just the quantum chemistry, but also the dynamics. So with these two tools, one can model systems going from very small, medium, large, that's what a computational chemist would, would say about large, which is not uh, very impressive, but that's what we call large. And you can also put these, these molecules into different environments, for example, solution, or more complicated biological environments, and you can just look at the different properties. And um, you want to look at dynamics, I mean, one can use quantum mechanics, so very exact equations when you have like small systems, and dynamics can go from femtoseconds to picoseconds, so from the times where nuclei are moving in the femtoseconds to few picoseconds, you have to go to quantum classical methods uh, for studying um, very soon um, other systems, and if you want to treat very large systems, then you need to resort to classical mechanics. And I put this into parentheses because when you are in this regime, the side states are over. You cannot really follow the dynamics for these big systems in the, um, uh, with, this, with this technique, so this is already a piece of darkness that, that we have there, and you have processes from femtoseconds to microseconds, but there is no real way to follow microseconds dynamics in the, in the side states. So, I'm already hinting what are the challenges, right? So we have these two equations, and what are the challenges? So one main challenge is that the accuracy that we have for side states is something like 0.2 electron volts in best cases. And that's not very good. So if you think in the ground state, people talk about chemical accuracy, one kilocalorie per mole, or even a spectroscopical accuracy, one kilojoule per mole. So if you want to treat or look at some interactions in biology, sometimes it's just few kilocalories. So you need to be that precise. And when you're dealing with the side states, that's what you get if you're lucky. So this is, uh, this is bad because these energies are will come in this Hamiltonian. So this is something you inherit. Yeah, this accuracy for the quantum chemistry is something you inherit for doing dynamics. So you are coarse from the beginning because you carry this inaccuracy to the chemical dynamics. So let me just give you a feeling. Um, okay, and then, and then of course, uh, the other problem is despite this is not very good, it is very expensive. What means that at the moment, I hope this uh, will change in the future, but at the moment, the time scales that you can um, model are typically quite short. And many processes in, in nature, they have many different time scales. So this is, uh, this is also some darkness that we, that we have. Let me just give you a feeling uh, about this error. So this is just a collection of molecules. This is just a test set uh, for the expert. This is just the teal set. So it contains something like 50 molecules that people use as an example for testing new methods or just seeing how, how the accuracy of something it is. So here, I mean, don't care for these abbreviations. These are different flavors of methods that you can use for solving a side states. And you can see here the mean errors compared to the experiment for this uh, set of 50 molecules. And you see some errors, some methods produce you some positive errors, others produce you some negative errors. And uh, in the best that you can uh, hope is something like 0.2. Right, so that's that's uh, um, uh, not very not very good. Now the accuracy of the methods depend on the system, so it's even this is an average. But of course, even if some method could look like promising for a particular system, um, there are no clear trends. It depends very much. The error depends on the size. And when we have a side state, we have many side states. So sometimes the accuracy is not the same for the different side states. Right? So even if you pick a method because a particular state is good, this doesn't even mean that you're going to have a warranty that for other states are, are the same good. So why do we care? Let me just put you this example. So this is a very small molecule, teoformaldehyde. You irradiate this molecule. Here in this graph, you have um, where are the electronic levels, the first 
singlet state and the lowest to triplet states. Okay, from the experiment you only know the precision, the location of the singlet states. These are very, very accurate methods, and you see these are um, quite uh, nicely in comparison with with the experiment. And here you have again different flavors of different methods, and that's how the predictions are. You could say, well, the good news is like at least the states are always ordered in the same way. That's good. Could be worse. In many systems, you have different order. Um, <laughs> knowing that the precision of the side states is not so good, you could say, well, uh, it doesn't it doesn't look that bad. Maybe I can live with these errors. But now you just try to plug this into dynamics, and then you see um, if you see transition from a singlet to a triplet. So this, this molecule has, is phosphorescent, so it means that eventually it goes to a triplet, but it does not go to a triplet in a picosecond time scale. And now you do dynamics in a picosecond time scale, and then these very accurate methods, they, do the right, they, they produce the right answer, so you don't see intersystem crossing in, the, in this time scale, but in other methods, you see it. And there is no correlation. This is not something you could have been able to predict. We're able to understand what this is, now, a posteriori, but you would not be able to predict it. So you see how frustrating this can be. I mean, there are many methods there. All of them, from the statical point of view, they are not so bad. But then when you move out of the front condon region, so where the place where you decide, then the errors, they change totally. And that's also normally something that you don't necessarily see because that's what you have dynamics to tell you where to go. And then the potentials, they totally fail outside this equilibrium region. And then they give you very different answers. So with this, I want to show you that there is still a lot of darkness even in this type of calculations, and you need to be very careful which method do you use because you can get any answer. So this is maybe this reminds me to this uh, quotation of, of Einstein that uh, uh, sometimes you you need to believe in modeling. So a theory is something nobody believes except the person who makes it, and uh, yeah, maybe. The, the, the other side is experiment is something everybody believes except the person who made it. So you need to believe in your theory, you need to be very careful because otherwise you can get any answer, right? So whenever we make these this, uh, this calculations, we just look very carefully which is the level of theory that you have to use to do that. So I want to present you here. Um, Antonio already mentioned our uh, workhorse for doing dynamics. So this is a method that is called SHARK, so surface hopping including arbitrary couplings. And this is uh, a method which is quite general and is a quantum classical method, so already combines quantum and classical for including any type of couplings. So in general, non-adiabatic couplings is something that it was this method with non-adiabatic couplings was there uh, 25 years ago, and we just generalized it to in order to get any type of coupling, for example, this spinovic coupling. So we created this method in 2011. Uh, this is now uh, a review. We have two reviews. This is the recent, the most recent review of the new version of Shark, Shark 2, which was released this year, which is free. So I invite you all to Shark. If, uh, if you want. And then this is the, this is the method that we use to, to look into the dynamics of, of different systems. So let me just put you a couple of examples. Um, but first, so what is surface hopping? So you see in photochemistry, you always have to go from one surface to another. So you have a quantum classical treatment. So this means the, 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 the energies, the forces, the couplings, they are all calculated quantum mechanically. And this is done on the fly. And you have a set of trajectories, so the nuclei are just calculated classically following Newton equations. And you need to have a bunch of trajectories to mimic the, the quantum distribution of, of, of what is called a wave packet. And whenever you come to a crossing, you hop or not, depending on some um, uh, stochastic uh, um, um, equation. And that's why this is called uh, surface hopping. And this type of uh, um, transitions, they were just invented by John Tooley 25 years ago. So what we did was just generalizing this type of thing. So let me just put you a couple of examples how you use these things. So this is the field of uh, DNA, and um, uh, probably you already got the impression whenever you have organic molecules, I mean, they are always very um, weak and very, um, yeah, if you put light into that, they can degradate. Yeah, That's the reason why you have to put beer in, in, in a glass, which is, uh, which is not uh, letting pass in the light. However, nuclear bases, which are these, apparently simple organic molecules, 
they are not degradating. So they are so-called photostable, so they are able to transform very efficiently light into heat. Yeah, and there are speculations that maybe that's why evolution took these molecules for building our DNA or something else, because they are photostable, so we can go outside in the sun, and then they don't, they don't, they don't degrade, they don't destroy. And the reason for that is attributed for having potential energy surfaces that they have crossings between the potential surfaces, like between the S1 and the ground state, so that when you are exciting and you arrive to this excited state, you can very quickly deactivate to the ground state. When I say quickly, it means ultra fast in the femtosecond time scale. And then this prevents the system to be somewhere um, upstairs and then going somewhere else, going some chemical reaction and then, and then uh, degrade it. So these molecules are special, but this is not that simple. This has many different processes uh, behind and there have been a very large community of theoreticians and experimentalists looking into these processes. So we also joined that club. We wanted to put shark there to work. And let me just show you one example. So this is ketocytosine. This is the canonical form of cytosine that enters into the DNA. And then when you make the anamnes on that with shark, this is a typical picture you obtain. So this is the average of these trajectories, typically let's say 100 trajectories. And this is one picosecond in logarithmic time scale. And this is the time evolution of the different states that you have. So you see the S2 is the brightest state, and then very quickly in several hundreds of femtoseconds is the case, and some population is transferred to the S1. You see the recovery of the ground state in an ultra-fast time scale, so within 10 femtoseconds, population returns to the ground state, so this is photostable. But we got extremely surprised because we also saw population going to the triplet state. This was very unexpected because to go to the triplet state, you need to have a spinovic couplings. Spinovic couplings is something that you typically have when you have heavy atoms. There is no heavy atoms here. So the spinovic couplings are very small. So what the textbook says is that this process takes very long, so typically nanoseconds. And when we saw this, there was a lot of resistance from the community, thinking this cannot be, but this is something that is not only uh, appearing here in cytosine, we also look at other PDBD nucleobases, and we saw the same phenomena. So you also have some triplet population in a time scale which competes with the internal conversion, the decay of these processes to the ground state, and this has some relevance also uh, for, for, for the nucleobases. And uh, we discovered this type of processes here, and then in the last years we just saw that this is uh, not everywhere, but this is kind of ubiquitous in, in many systems, so we were also in, um, investigating different nucleobases where we made some substitutions. So you could expect that when you put a bromide, which is much heavier, you have higher spinovic couplings, and then you should have more intersystem crossing. This is not exactly the case, but depending how you make these substitutions, for example, an oxygen with a sulfur, you indeed see an effect. In molecules like SO2, endoperoxides, benzophenones, so molecules having a carbonyl group, also they prompt to do intersystem crossing. Molecules having some nitro groups, they also have intersystem crossing and ultra fast time scale. We also investigated some T offense. So this was not something exotic. This is something that is happening in many in many uh, organic systems around. If it's happening in organic systems, of course it should be, and it is, uh, ubiquitous in many transition metals. When you have transition metals, you have a metal here, so this is precisely the type of system you would expect to have um, big, large intersystem crossing because you have large um, uh, spinovic coupling. So we investigated uh, in this complex this uh, intersystem crossing reaction and we saw there was something like uh, two, five femtoseconds, within two and five femtoseconds uh, you go into the, into the triplet states. We also started to investigate uh, a lot of reactions, a lot of processes in this renin complex that I will just mention with a little bit more of detail because this is a complex that is very dear to Nancy. We studied a project in this renin complex in collaboration with uh, Chantal Daniel in Strasbourg and Antonio Monari and Xavier Asfel in Nancy. And this molecule is important because when you insert it in some metalloproteins, you can have electron transfer uh, long range. So you have here a copper, and then you, you irradiate the system, and somehow the electron is able to hop all the way from the copper to the renin. 
And what was even more surprising, and it was published in Science by these experimental people, is that this uh, hop of the electron depends on the amino acid that you put there. Right? So we were interested in this, uh, in this type of systems, and thus uh, we had a project together. But the system is very complex and it's quite complicated to study. And this all started, we said, okay, in an SS stage, uh, we will just put the protein, but let's start just with water. And the system is very flexible. So you have to start doing some classical simulations in the ground state. And then one can see that you really have different type of conformations in the ground state, what makes a side state study is very complicated. So together with, uh, with uh, Antonio, we had to develop different sampling methods, which is called sampling methods, so ways to uh, identify and keep the right uh, measure between all these conformations for starting uh, simulations in the SI states. But uh, we managed, we got uh, a reasonable description of the SI states and a reasonable description uh, of how to sample these conformations so we could even do dynamics. And this is done using multi-scale methods, so you take this chromophore, the, the metal complex, in a, in a level that you call is treated with quantum mechanics, and then all the water molecules you treat uh, classically, so this is the molecular mechanics, and then using this type of partition between the different parts, you can do dynamics. So this is a simulation, again as before, like for in this case, 250 femtoseconds. This is the average of 100 trajectories. And you see you have a lot of states, but the red ones are the triplets. You see they are immediately growing up. So the, you start in the blues, which are the singlets, and then within nothing, within few femtoseconds, you go into the triplets, and this simulation is in water. To give you a feeling what this really computationally uh, means, so these are 250 femtoseconds. Normally, we make time steps every half a femtosecond. So you have 250 femtoseconds, and you make steps every half a femtosecond, and we make 100 trajectories. This means 50,000 calculations. Each of these calculations takes something like 70 minutes in 16 cores. So this means this graph here took something like a million core hours. Of course, you go to a computer center to get this because you have a normal computer. It will take like 100 years to do, which is not, um, not feasible. So you see, this is not amazingly big. This is not also, I mean, it's complex, but it's not amazingly complex, and it takes a lot of time. So the hope that one can do this for longer times, the hopes that you can do this for bigger systems, is at the moment with the technology that we have, is cut it. We cannot dream like that, right? If you look outside, Big challenges. You have many systems which are multi-chromophoric, right? So this is like in photosynthesis. I mean, you have different antennas that collect light, and then the light hops into some catalytic centers. So if you want to describe this type of processes, like this uh, photosystem two, or just some um, artificial systems, or like this, there are many of these systems which are super attractive for materials and for advancing science. They have many chromophores. So when you have many chromophores, there's no way you can make the trick of saying this part is QM and this part is MM, because you need actually to put almost everything in the QM part. And you've seen how expensive were these calculations. So you have a lot of difficulties. I mean, the size is huge. You have to take into account all the fluctuations, the non-diabatic effects, the time scales. We were doing this for 250 femtoseconds. There are things that occur also in picoseconds, in nanoseconds. This is just close to our eyes. Yeah? We are totally blind to all these things. Of course, people are thinking how to do that. Um, you can use brute force in some cases. So this is one example of our research. If you look into DNA, I mean, actually, you have many chromophores there, right? So we made something quite crazy. We just took this, uh, this strand with 20 amino acids, uh, sorry, with 20 uh, nucleobases. We put eight in the, in the QM region, hoping this is enough to look into the spectrum. The rest, the water and the other uh, 16 um, adenines in this polyadenine, they are in the MN region. And then we calculate in the spectrum. And then this was uh, very interesting because there have been uh, 50 years of uh, speculations how many bases are really excited when you excite, put light into DNA. Is it one? Is it two? Is it all of them? And there were, in 50 years, papers for everything, from one to all of them, everything you want. When you decompose the spectrum that we got, you see that actually the, the, the localization of the excitation is just 20% in one nucleobase, 50% in two, and 20% in three, and the rest is negligible. So actually, this was telling you, okay, we start with excited states which are involving one, two, and three nucleobases. 
these are uh, actually when you look carefully into these uh, states, they are exciton states. And uh, we saw that, so then the, the, the contribution for other states is uh, negligible, and this was uh, really very important. And lately, we weren't even crazy enough of uh, trying to do dynamics with that, so we also, um, you don't want to know how expensive that was, but we saw that actually these exciton states, they take something like 700 femtoseconds to convert to exciplase, so to chart transfer states. Actually, there were some experiments published in science seeing these chart transfer states within one picosecond, and we were saying, okay, but you start with exciton states, so we really wanted to see the evolution of these states, and this is very important for biology because these uh, states, they put electrons somewhere, so these are initiators of radicals, so they are, uh, of course, very important for biological processes. So, and we just saw that, uh, yeah, within 700 femtoseconds, this was uh, happening. So, in some cases, you have a lot of massive resources. You can, you can do up to one picosecond, you can make a very big region, but in many cases, this is not possible. You have to invent something else. So one can develop some ap approximate models, and uh, there are many people uh, thinking how to do that, and we too. So you can, if you have systems where you have different chromophores, say in this case just two chromophores here depicted in red, alpha and beta, you can just devise uh, Hamiltonians where they have just the, the computation of the individual uh, side states of these chromophores. So this is just for all the uh, the side states of this plus this plus plus any one that you want, and then you just de de define uh, or figure out how to um, um, describe the coupling between these uh, these two things. But none of these models, ours or the ones that are outside there, they are perfect. So this means that whenever everybody anybody is trying to um, go into some particular question relevant for biology, depending which approximation you take, you get a different answer, and then at the end you don't really see what, what is going on. So this is just to, to, to tell you, to try to convince you that there is a lot of darkness still there. There are a lot of interesting systems that are open to the field of computational photochemistry, and most of them, they have this multi-chromophore, um, uh, there are these multi-chromophore systems, but uh, still, this is open to device, maybe wait for the leap of quantum computing and then get an amazing uh, amount of, uh, of computer time. There are also approaches, we're also working on that approach based on machine learning that allows you to replace this expensive computational uh, chemistry by very, very, very cheap um, um, physical models. Um, that then will just give you the access to a long time scale. There are many different ideas there, but uh, still we don't know which of them will, will win. So let me just finish with this epilogue, understanding radiation, UV ra radiation, and looking at all these mechanisms is essential for progressing in many fields. And uh, yeah, chemistry, biology, physics, uh, information technology, because we want to develop these intelligent photonic materials, but unless you have a precise knowledge of what are the mechanisms going on, you cannot make uh, accurate predictions. And theory is essential for this. But sometimes you feel like this poor guy, you're in the middle of the ocean, you're isolated, and you look into the horizon and uh, you still don't know where you're gonna find the answer. But um, okay, we'll look, keep looking and uh, we hope that we will just progress very much in this very exciting field. So with this, I'm just coming to the end and I already mentioned many people. I just only put three pictures of three generations of students I was very lucky, as I said before, to work with fantastic people that um, were doing the science and they have been so brilliant that allows us to make big progress. I just put here a list, I'm pretty sure that I, I have forgotten people. I had a lot of uh, collaborators, many theoreticians that with which we use uh, joint efforts to, to make progress, but also many experimentalists that they gave us a lot of uh, difficulties and made a lot of headache, how to interpret, how to predict, how to progress in the experiment, and I am very thankful to all of them because they make us progress and advance to the front. Finally, and just collecting here, the, the agencies, the organizations who believed in our ideas and, uh, and gave us uh, money, uh, the University of Vienna, probably also I should put uh, Jena and, uh, and all the universities that they have given me the freedom and the trust to, do, to put all these all this, um, 
ideas to work and uh, do some exciting science. And also the Vienna Scientific Cluster, I am very indebted to, to them because they give us an uh, amazing large amount of CPU time that they're very unbureaucratic, I would say, that we can use for making sometimes these uh, very crazy calculations, but that they give us a lot of uh, interesting results and uh, interesting science. So to all of them, thank you very much. And to all of you, thank you very much for your patience and listening. Okay. So thanks a lot, Leticia, for this very nice lecture, summarizing a lot of what you do. Uh, like in every scientific conference, it's uh, now time to open the discussions for questions or comments from the, from the audience. Um, hi. Um, when I saw your title, I was um, sure that you were going to talk about nuclear photonics at some point. Uh, since the uh, Z-Well experiment, when they just do the same thing as you do with just sodium and iodide, uh, you're showing some good improvements of the techniques. But I was going to ask a more formal question for the average here. Maybe to your eyes, will you, some electrons will look the same maybe when we will have the proper glasses to look at it? Or will it be some normal, uh, with our normal eyes, will we see some, uh, not a population density, or will we see something clear, or maybe will we see some light? I don't know. What, what, what do you mean by when, with your eyes? Um, when we will go deep into the into but the atoms, will we, will we see what we will see? <laughs> but you mean with, with the appropriate experimental techniques, so with the spectroscopy? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but this is, I mean, I was just focused on the, on the theory, but many of these things are backed up by the experiment. The experiment doesn't have, I mean, they, they do a lot of amazing uh, time resolve experiments on the femtosecond time scale. So, for example, in this ruthenium 3 spirit deal, yeah, to give you an example, they were making experiments with resolution to 10 femtoseconds, and they really saw evidence that you go to the triplet within 10 femtoseconds. Now, with the theory, of course, we just uh, unravel the complexity. It's not just one state. We had a lot of, I mean, that particular case, we had like 60 states that they were kind of excited simultaneously, and we saw that the time scale was like 5 femtoseconds. Right, so you can go into more detail because you have theory, but many of these things are, in as much as possible, just hand in hand with the experiment. But the experiment doesn't know what type of states you have, how many states you have. The, the, the experiment also has a problem, and is that they have to probe. They pump, so they excite, something is going on, and then they have to see this, and they have a probe, and, uh, and then sometimes the probe also mask the processes of the of of the pump yeah in the theory of course you can also model the probe but the experiment the, the theory is nice because you just do exactly what you would expect to see and you see what is the effect of these pump pulse and and you can see that so so it's not just uh, some uh, magic or something exotic i mean this is all in some cases back up by experiment or the experiment is something and we are able to unmask what is behind this experiment is this what you mean Okay. Are there other questions? Fissions, you don't have a question? Feel free to ask any question. Yeah. There. No, no, uh, you, it, it's recorded, so you have to wait. Yeah, um, thanks. So I'm a physicist, so I have a very, very naive physics question, but you emphasized the fact that you had only two equations in your talk, but for me it was only one. <coughs> so uh, can, you can you elaborate on, on why you consider that yeah, these were different equations? Thank you very much for the question. I mean, uh, one could do a full semester course about these things. Of course, this is one equation, which is the time measuring equation, and from this you can derive the the um, time independent Schrodinger equation and even there. But when you are just going into more details, 
You start with the time dependent Schrodinger equation. From there, you can derive the time independent. From the time independent, you can also distinguish, that's what we call in, in theory the von Oppenheimer approximation. You can distinguish an equation for the electrons, an equation for the nuclei. And then how to solve these equations brings to many more equations. So this was a simplification for today. But there are many, many. <laughs> what did you mean? Of so course, I understand. But uh, what did you mean? I mean, more precisely, do you mean that it was? Uh, I mean that, that you have diff different set, completely different sets of techniques to attack. Yes. Both? Yes, there are completely different uh, set of techniques to tackle these two equations, and they are even different. I mean, these are like in theoretical chemistry, you can even find like different fields, and there are people which are totally specialized in solving this time independent Schrodinger equation for the electrons or the electronic problem, which is called, and then completely, let's say, different community, which is just devoted to solve the nuclear motion, yeah? to having a wave function which has nuclei and time, and the others, they have a wave function which is for a fixed configuration. You have many different ways, approximations, to solve the electronic uh, part. And my point was like, if you want to have a view in this field, you have to marry these two communities to play these two different pianos in order to get some sun some, some insights. Okay, thanks. So other questions, comments? If not, I think Xavier should <laughs> come again on stage. But first, thank again, Leticia, for this talk. No, it, it's very easy. Thank you very much. Leticia, congratulations. It was really a pleasure. And um, you are all invited now to have a drink or to eat something. I hope there will be food. Where? When? Yeah, we will. Donc, vous êtes tous invités au pot de cocktail qui aura lieu dans l'atrium juste en dessous à gauche en sortant de l'amphithéâtre et avant <rire> tout le monde me fait des signes c'est fabuleux <rire> mais avant de quitter l'amphi et de clore cette cérémonie très officielle et sérieuse j'aimerais avant tout remercier beaucoup la faculté des sciences et son personnel Stéphanie Bogart si elle est encore là merci beaucoup pour tout ce que tu as fait euh, J'aimerais aussi remercier les services de la DRV, de la DIRCOM, de tous les autres services, la, la communication, la vidéo, euh, les caméras, ceux qui ont tapé sur les machines d'actylo. C'est quoi Je sais pas, tu me fais des signes que je comprends pas, donc forcément. Non, en tout cas, merci à tous. Vous voyez, vous voyez ils sont en haut de cet amphi. Merci beaucoup d'avoir réservé ces merveilleux habits. <coughs> La prochaine fois, on fera ça un jour, il fait moins 10, comme ça on aura bon. Là, il fait un peu chaud à l'intérieur. Non, en tout cas, merci beaucoup à tous. C'est grâce à vous que cet événement a pu avoir lieu. Et donc, je vous invite à aller dans l'atrium boire le pot de l'amitié.